Awesome. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started because well, I'm in Atlanta and it's late for me, as Christy knows, <laughs> whenever we record a podcast at this time. Um, but we're really excited that you all are here. We just wanted to, um, so I'm Catherine. I am one of the hosts of the Girls Gone Gravel podcast. I started the Girls Gone Gravel community. And then um, my podcast co-host is here with me, Christy Moan, who has a little something to do with that event in Kansas that you all are going to be taking on. And uh, if you're in the women's cyclist, gravel cyclist group, that's also part of Girls Gone Gravel. But I just know from years and years of going to events um, or not going to events because I didn't know anybody, it could be really intimidating when, when you don't know anybody and you're taking on a big challenge and you're not quite sure what to expect. So tonight is just the uh, Unbound team is graciously here with us. And they're going to be sharing a little bit about the course and the things that are going on at the event. And then um, we'll have some time for Q&A. And then I'm actually going to break us up into some small groups so that you can meet other women that are coming to the event. So you'll get to, to meet some other people uh, real briefly at the end. So um, why don't everybody that's here kind of helping out tonight, Treva, we'll start with you. Why don't you just introduce yourself and what, what you're here for? Sure. Why are you here? I don't, I don't know. I just decided to join. <laughs> I saw this on the internet was like, hey, why not? No, I'm Treva Whirl. I'm the athlete service manager for Unbound and many other events. And um, I live in Emporia and I try to write as much as I can. Haven't been doing it lately, but would like to get back out there. But I'm probably the one you talk to if you need to email any questions. And Treva, can you tell them how long you've been with the event oh, and what yeah. got you involved? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so I've actually been um, technically for two years, um, but what got me into the event is volunteering at the checkpoints um, in Madison, which is my hometown. And um, I started out just volunteering and then I started to um, be the, I was the I guess the halt, the head volunteer coordinator there. And then I moved on up to the volunteer coordinator slash office manager, and they just decided to keep me. And here I am. <laughs> I like they can't decide to keep you. All right, Christy. <laughs> I, think we should, I think we should go with Leland next. Like okay. people, the, yeah. the one guy that has been allowed. The one guy on the show. On, we've never had a guy on the show even. No. You're, the, you're the first guy involved in any of our girls on craft, Leland. Well, my name is Leland, and I'm here to meet the male quota. <laughs> uh, check that box. No, I am the uh, event manager for Unbound. Um, I first got involved 13 years ago, so I've been in and around this event for 13 of the 15 years of its existence. Um, I participated in 2008. Um, had volunteered and supported um, some of the salsa crew and other event sponsors and then formally joined the team in 2013 became a co-owner alongside Jim and, and Christy and so for most of those working years I've been the operations manager and, and kind of event director race director all those titles are applicable so I hope to be able to share with you guys some uh, event logistics for this year's event there will be some changes that we'll get to talk about um, course information any questions you have around the operations and logistics of the race and I'm Christy Moan uh, born and raised in Emporia Kansas and have been with the event um, my husband was one of the initial 15 riders that participated and then just kind of stuck with it, um, became an official partner with it and after the 2008 event and have just kind of stuck around. Um, I'm really excited everybody's here. I'm, I'm grateful that we were able to put this together because I think this is gonna be a great opportunity for you all to ask your questions and hear a little bit about some of the course updates that we've got for you. Um, and also just really to let you know that our team here in Emporia is, is literally here for you. So if you guys have questions, um, we're ready to help. Um, it's, I know it can be daunting, but really I think when you surround yourself with the right people, you're gonna, you're gonna experience success. And that's, that's ultimately what we wanna see at our event is you to be successful. So, so thanks Catherine for organizing. 
course. And then we also have Kim joining us tonight. So Kim um, is not on the Unbound team, which I'm also excited about. So we have, she uh, wanted to connect uh, women for this event. And I said, hey, we're already looking at this. Why don't you join us? So Kim, tell us about you. Yeah, hi. Um, so I weekend warrior. I started out as a weekend warrior. I'm a Navy pilot. Uh, I was like, what's this gravel thing? It's got a lot of grit, looks amazing. I started out as a roadie, got in a cycle cross. And then I said, oh, I'm going to do this. You know, at the time it was Dirty Cans and now I'm bound. I said, I'm going to, if I'm going to get registered, I'll do this lottery thing. And I got in and that was my first experience. And that's all she wrote. So racing gravel is the thing I do. Uh, it's my number one hobby. I train six days a week for it now. Like I've gone from like weekend warrior, still weekend warrior, just put more time into it. But I love it. And, you know, huge shout out to the Unbound team. Uh, you are amazing. I mean, to be that, to be your first gravel experience, I would say they would always answer an email. Even the day of, you get there and the expo is very welcoming. Everyone is super welcoming. The town is welcoming. Um, it's not overwhelming. They're always there to answer questions. I mean, even the head person's always just there, like very involved. So if this is your first gravel race, this is the race to do because you will love it. I promise you that. Oh, Thanks, Kim. Of course not. We've got that on recording too, Christy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play that anytime I'm feeling in the dumps. So I'll put that on repeat. <laughs> and I am recording I just so other women might want to um, see this in the future that weren't able to come tonight. So, because there's going to be a lot of great tips from the Unbound team. So, just so you know that if you don't want to be on video, just turn your video off. Um, uh, but you all look great. So, you should be on video and smile. <laughs> and own it. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, I think what everybody is curious about is let's start with the course. What's what's happening in this event this year? What's it gonna be like? Well, I can tell you that there have not been significant changes to the courses from 2019. So anyone that participated the last time we were able to have the event, um, the courses have not changed dramatically. In fact, the 150, um, the 25 slash juniors, because our juniors riders share the same course as the 25 milers, those have all not experienced any changes. Um, so for those that have participated in any of those in 2019, you've got a little bit of a leg up. The 200 mile distance um, did have a small change, but it was relatively insignificant. It is, I would say, 90 seven 98 percent the same course there was one small change we made into Wabunsee County um, prior to your first stop in Alma so that course is the same the XL I didn't see any 350 mile riders in our chat over there but in case anyone didn't want to put that out there the the 350 mile XL distance is dramatically different um, it, for anyone that knew in 2019, everything went north except for the XL. So we have changed that course to where every event is going out of Emporia to the north. Um, it's kind of like Russian dolls, just big stacked loops, one on top of the other is a pretty general way of describing how they all play together. With the one exception being that XL because it's nearly twice the distance of the 200. So it does a big loop around, even gets a little south before coming back into Emporium. Um, so significantly for the 100 and 200, again, 100 is the same. So there's not too much to update there. There's a halfway stop in Council Grove, comes at about roughly mile 54, I believe. So basically halfway into that event, it's the only opportunity that 100 milers have to meet their support crews. Um, for those that don't know, if you're not coming with your own support crew, you, Treva, correct me if I'm wrong, but can you still get in on the crew for hire program? Yes. Yeah. So if you cannot travel with someone to be your support, you can take advantage of our um, crew for hire services. And I will say Kelly Trujillo that's on the call here, her father is heavily involved with that. And you would see there in Council Grove um, on that crew for hire service. So um, it's a great program where they really take care of you if you don't have someone. Um, but uh, pretty much the same for the 100. The 200 mile course, that, that small change didn't really, really alter things in terms of the logistics. So there are only two checkpoints for the 200 mile distance. And if you're doing the math, that means they're not every 50 miles. 
Historically, uh, we used to have three checkpoints in the 200 uh, mile distance. And those three checkpoints would have came about every 50 miles. In our 10th anniversary, we changed that model and went to two checkpoints um, just to increase the challenge. We came back to the three checkpoint model, but then ultimately, uh, well, 2019 was the first time we went back to the, it was the second time we did the two checkpoint model. And we believe that's a model that's gonna stay. So you've got about 65 miles to the first stop, about 85 miles to the second, uh, and then 50 miles to bring it on home. Now I will say as intimidating as that might sound, your biggest leg in the middle of 85 miles, there are two naturally occurring water opportunities. One called the General Volen store, uh, the Volen General store, excuse me. And then uh, in a little community called Alta Vista in the park there. And both of those have um, water that is potable and, and um, definitely would get you by in a pinch. And those occur about every 30 miles. So you're never more than 30 miles without water. And then naturally for those familiar with the event, um, there are plenty of wonderful ranch families and houses along the course that would be more than happy to bail you out if you really get into trouble. You can pull into someone's driveway, knock on the door, and um, the vast majority of people will um, be generous and allow you to, to get some water. Or you probably will even see families and young children out at the end of the driveways with Cokes and beverages or a hose ready to turn on and hose you down. So um, you do have to bring your own snacks. Um, you do uh, need to be prepared to cover those distances under your own power with the supplies you need. Um, that's a uh, pretty good overview of what those distances look like. And then of course the XL, just to touch on that, completely self-supported event, big, big distances without services, upwards of a hundred miles without um, seeing a town. Um, so those riders really have to um, get some bags on their bikes and, and be prepared with water and food and the supplies they need to get between um, the general, the KCs and the gas stations, convenience stores in between the towns that they get to visit. Um, but pretty extreme back to the gravel routes. That's how gravel started was entirely self-supported. Um, support crews were not a thing in the first few years of Dirty Kansas even. Um, so that was a real game changer when we started to allow people to have someone meet them in those towns and give them some resupply. Anyways, more history lesson you want to know about, of course. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Leland. Uh, if people could put in the chat, maybe is, if this is your first time, like maybe say first time, if it's your first time, or what if you're a repeat offender, <laughs> a, repeat, a repeat rider, uh, just post in there, just so we kind of know who we're talking to. Ooh, lots of first timers coming in. That's so awesome. Very exciting. Leland, do you want to talk, I mean, you talked like kind of the overview of the course. Do you want to tell people about a little bit about the condition of, of conditions of the roads that they're going to see? And I know we saw a question about the 50 and the 100, do they overlap? So that's a great question. Okay. So the Again, if you can kind of envision, let me address the overlapping to start with. Um, a lot of the courses do share the start and the finish. The mileage varies depending on the length of the event. They all kind of go up in the same fashion, cut over at the necessary point where they break off, and then loop back around in the same general sense. So if you can imagine those nesting dolls where you're just unpacking them, that's kind of what it looks like. So everyone will kind of go out the same general direction. Everyone comes in. This I would say the first 10 miles and the last 10 miles are shared by just about every route. Um, but of course, the and we'll get into the schedule here in a little bit. I don't want to get off on that tangent just yet. But of course, there's not overlap in the sense of you shouldn't be running into different people because we stagger the starts and have everyone spaced out. Um, as far as the course, there is a lot of uh, class four gravel out there for anyone who ever saw Neil Shirley's um, types of gravel article that he wrote many years ago. Um, you will you should expect to see some chunky rock. Um, some sharp rock. This is, the Flint Hills are notorious for um, slicing tires. And that's because this chert, this limestone rock, fractures really easily. And it fractures in a way that it creates very sharp edges. And it's not uncommon to see the spine of a rock sticking up vertical out of the road. 
um, like a, an ax blade or a knife. And in fact, the Native American tribes that lived in this area absolutely used this material for their tools and weapons and, and things of that nature. So when we say um, these are arrowheads, they literally were arrowheads and, and they fracture in that fashion. So um, sturdy tires is a must and a knowledge of how to repair a flat tire and not just a puncture, but a boot potentially because a cut uh, can be very common. Um, you will also, though, see periods of um, pretty smooth gravel, and what you'll see is two lines in the road. Um, the, these roads are not well, well-traveled, obviously, very rural area. So typically, you'll see either two or three with the middle tread being shared by both directions of traffic, but two to three at most tracks in there, and those could be pretty worn and smooth. So you'll have a little bit of reprieve on occasion, um, but a comfortable setup and a comfortable ride is a must because it's, you know, every course is almost 100% gravel. The only time you experience any pavement is coming in and out of a checkpoint town or in and out of Emporia when you're departing and coming home. And it's minimal. I mean, your rollout from Emporia is a mile and a half of pavement. That's it. Um, and in these communities are even smaller. So I would say even in a 200 mile course, less than five miles of pavement. Um, it's not much. So 200 miles of gravel in that 200, we say 200 miles, but just to let you know, it's, the course is 206, <laughs> 206 miles. You get six bonus. We didn't even charge you for the bonus. Yeah, we mark. don't charge you for the extra six. <laughs> um, I will say that if you've seen the pictures of the infamous year of the mud, 2015, if we do get water, uh, if we get rain, you can see puddles across the road. It can be very gritty. I will tell you, though, that the number of um, miles that would be dirt roads that could be turned into mud are next to none. And that was something we've learned over the years because uh, while it makes for great pictures and it makes for great stories after the fact, it's really not a greatly pleasurable experience hiking your bike or potentially ruining your day early on in a ride. Uh, we had a lot of people within the first 10 miles shred derailers and ruin their bikes and, and couldn't continue. But more than anything, from a safety perspective, an ambulance can't get down a dirt road that has turned to peanut butter mud. And your guys' safety is a, always our number one priority. So we have uh, gone to great lengths to avoid the dirt roads. And that's okay with us because you're here to ride gravel and we got plenty of that and it will challenge you all the same. You will encounter some roads that you're like, wait a second, this is not a road. No vehicles are traveling down this. <laughs> um, they're going to be chunky and rutted. And, uh, but the dirt that can turn into that nasty mud that you've seen in the photos, uh, the last few years, we've really started to remove that. So you um, expect to get dirty, obviously, but uh, you should not have to experience big sections of hike a bike. That doesn't mean you won't, but they won't be big sections. <laughs> won't be big sections. Yeah. Miles on end. Awesome. Well, why don't you all, I know this is kind of the thing that everybody has been wondering about and maybe a little less now that um, the vaccine rollout's going a little bit better, but what's this year gonna be like, especially for people coming back or people that are still a little like on the fence because of COVID? Why don't y'all give us an insight? Well, just, just so everybody knows, we have a full update coming out tomorrow that everyone will receive. Um, so you guys are a little bit ahead of the game. And really the only reason I mention that is that um, Treve is the one that deals with all of the athletes when they start having questions anytime we do an update like this. Um, so I just ask that you give her the space to let that roll out tomorrow um, and let, I mean, you guys can ask your questions obviously, but but for friends and family, maybe let that roll out of the, of the announcement come out um, tomorrow morning so that Treva can be ready for everybody with questions. So um, I guess probably Leland, you're, you the one, you're the one that works most directly with the community and, and the health department and whatnot. So why don't you go ahead and just kind of yeah. kick off about some of our changes for 2021? Yeah, so let's start with some general lay of the land and situation here in Lyon County, Kansas. Um, we have come down dramatically here. I'm very, I want to say I'm very proud. I know we have some Emporians here on the call. Pat ourselves on the back. We've been doing a really good job locally uh, in this area. I think we're down to 
uh, a dozen or less active cases of COVID, um, which is tremendous from where we were in the hundreds uh, end of last year. Um, so we've come down significantly. This community is on track with vaccinations. Now that only addresses here. Obviously the situation looks different anywhere you go in the US, but I kind of set that stage to let everyone know that here in this region, um, the situation looks very good. But even though things are improving here, even if things do get lifted, um, this team is going to go above and beyond, and I can tell you that social distancing will be in play, mask usage will be in play, and that's because we are bringing a lot of people to this community and people that are coming from all over the world, uh, and of course, all over the United States, and we want to do our due diligence, and we want to prove not just for Unbound, not just for Emporia in the surrounding area, but for the entire world that we can do this safely. And in order to do that, we're going to be pretty strict on those two things in particular. So we're going to ask that people, um, you know, avoid those reunion hugs. I know we're all coming together as a gravel community and a gravel family, but um, keep your elbows and fist bumps uh, ready and make sure to keep your distance from people that are outside of your travel group. We're going to ask that of everybody. Um, there's also some things that we're doing. Um, if a lot of first timers, but for those that are repeaters, there will be no activities in person in the Granada Theater. So the writers meeting, the TED style talks that we've done, those will take place, but they'll be pre-recorded or live. And that schedule will come out uh, at a later date. So the, you will get to view and, and take part in those things, just not in that setting of the Granada Theater. If you've seen those pictures or been there, it's we max that to capacity, 850 people shoulder to shoulder, and we just we're not going to take that risk this year. So the only indoor activity that will take place all weekend is Treva's packet pickup. Um, you, we do need you to, to get your packet in person. You will have to present your ID. We need to know that you are who you say you are. And that way I can't take Treva's spot because she says she's not going to make it. And then I crash out there and EMTs think I'm Treva. That would be a, a bad, bad deal. And that, that we get mistaken a lot for that. Um, so that will take place. But I will say this, the history center where we do that is a very large three-story building with a clear front entrance and a clear um, exit out the back. So there will be social distancing throughout that space. There will be mask usage while indoors. You will be asked to enter through the front, go to the appropriate floor. There'll be signage directing you which floor you'll check in based on your event distance, and you will exit down the back stairway and out the back of the building. We'll also ask that the rider only enters that space. Um, you may be traveling with friends and family that are your support crew, um, but there's no logistical need for them to be in that building at that time. And in order to reduce the number of bodies, we're going to ask that the rider only come in for packet pickup. Treva, anything you need to add about that space? No, nope, she's shaking her head. No. You did really well. Thank you. We're, we're hitting all the boxes. Yes, you are. Um, okay, that takes me next to Expo. We do have a two-day Expo, Thursday, Friday. We do expect to have that. We have two full city blocks to spread those people, those booths out. So the booths will be more than six feet apart, I believe, um, greater than six feet probably. We have about the same number of vendors as 2019, but twice the amount of space, two city blocks opposed to one to be able to spread those people out. Again, it is when you're in, when you cannot keep six feet of separation. You will be asked to have a face covering on. Treva will be giving everyone a, a net gator, a buff as part of their um, swag bag. So if you don't come with your own, we'll have you covered. At least you'll have something you can throw around your neck and pull up if you need to. Um, so just be mindful of observing that. It's gonna be very important. Um, Otherwise, the expo is in an outdoor open air setting, so and it'll be very spaced out. So everyone feels very comfortable about how that will take place. Um, there will be a food and beer garden within that space. It'll be reduced and, and fenced in. So it's a very um, clear delineation between milling around, viewing the booths and going over here to get a food and drink, because obviously you'll have to pull your mask down to enjoy food and beverage. Um, but that'll, of course, the tables will be spread out. The chairs will be reduced at every table. All of those typical precautions you would see um, in a restaurant style setting, except for it's outdoor, which only plays more into our favor and works to our advantage. Um, so Thursday, three to eight, Saturday, 10 to five. Okay, here comes the big, the big, big news, the, the races. 
Yeah, and like Christy said, I want to reiterate that this information will be coming out in writing tomorrow. There will be an email kind of detailing this. You're getting the exclusive. This is the first time we're sharing this publicly. We hear will, first. You're hearing it first. We will be moving the 50, 25, and juniors from Saturday to Friday. Um, and this will now be a function of the expo. Um, now, before the alarm bells go off, drastically, we understand that this could possibly really change your travel plans or it could cause some issues that make you not be able to participate now as a result of that date change. It is only a day, but we recognize that day could really screw things up for you. Um, we're prepared again with this communication, we'll be able to outline what your options are. Um, we're gonna take care of you if this change prevents you from being able to participate. Um, we can get you a refund, we can defer you to next year. Hopefully you say, you know what, there's enough time I can figure this out and make that logistical change. Um, but this is under the recommendation of our um, health department. They wanna take those bodies and spread them out a little bit over multiple days. And this is the best way we felt we could do that because the 50, 25 and juniors um, all share similar course logistics and therefore it's easier to serve them, th those three together on the same day. The 200, 100 will remain on Saturday and we'll go off with little interruption in that respect. Um, the only noticeable change there on the start line would be uh, we will attempt to socially distance everybody on the start line. So for those larger 200 and 100 mile distance, that means we will be spreading the riders across multiple city blocks. Um, and that's okay because it is a neutral start. The Emporia Police Department will be rolling everyone out at a leisurely pace um, before we hit the gravel. And I fully believe there will be ample time for the entire group to kind of group back up uh, right about the time you're hitting the gravel. So I don't think anyone will be at a significant disadvantage by starting a little bit further back. And it will be a similar selfish seating kind of thing where we will be promoting, you know, if you're a 10 hour person, maybe try to line up near the front. And if you're a 20 hour person just trying to survive this thing, well, maybe you'll be at the back and you're not gonna be too concerned about um, getting a, a prime spot at the front of the, the group. Um, so that's kind of the news you, around. Oh yeah, go ahead, Christy. Can you give the start times for the, oh, yes, since yes, we are time. moving that, it's it's a little bit different, so. Yeah, so Friday, the juniors would go off first at 10 o'clock and that would coincide with the start, the opening of the expo. Um, now we may find, hopefully you, you all would will agree after we do this and see what it looks like, but we think this could end up being a permanent change for us moving forward. I think our 50, uh, excuse me, our juniors that go off at 10, our 50 and 25 will go off together at 1030. I think you're going to see more fanfare than you've had in the past because now the 200 and 100 milers will be able to celebrate in your launch and your return, which is something they've never been able to do. Um, and we actually think this could be a positive change. Of course, we'll be evaluating that. It's a necessary change for this year and something we'll evaluate going forward. But um, so those riders, juniors at 10, 50 and 25, which are leisure rides and not races. So they, and they share nearly an identical course, except the 50 does an extra loop uh, around Cahola Lake off of Americus. Um, but uh, just follow your own navigation. Don't follow any other riders. Um, those leisurely rides will start together so that the police department has, doesn't have to keep turning around doing multiple um, rollouts. Um, as you can imagine, we are a small town with limited resources and, and we don't have the officers to be able to do back to back to back to back rollouts. So that's why we need to combine that. And it's the 50 and 25 combined is only about 500 riders. So it's still only less than half of what our 200 would be if you can kind of envision that. And you'll have two city blocks to be able to spread out. You guys will then return, of course. Um, I do expect for our juniors, I don't believe there's any juniors in here, high school or middle school, but um, this is relevant for our, oh, can you guys still hear me? My screen just went, the screensaver, <laughs> sorry. Um, our juniors will be racing. It is a competitive distance. The timing mat will most likely be at Emporia State University. And that means the timing map for the 50 and 25 will also be at the university. 
What that means is because we've moved your start over to the expo, which is on mechanic and not commercial, you're actually now in a residential zone. And what we wanted to do was create an opportunity for the clock to stop in a safe spot, uh, which is only four or five blocks away from where the expo is. And then once the clock has stopped, you guys would then um, gingerly roll up the Highland Hill and back to the expo um, to take take part of the, the festivities there. So your finish line will not be where you started. It will be located somewhere on Highland Avenue um, at the university. Did you just say gingerly roll up the hill? Just a little stroll up old Highland Hill. I think, <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm I not right in there, Leland. Just I might put the finish line at the top of Highland. I just need to secure some power and so your finish might be at the top of Highland. We'll see how it goes. It's your last hill and it's not that far. Everyone, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> yeah, it's not a really big hill, but it can feel like a mountain at the end of your day, depending on how long a ride you've had. Well, I appreciate everything that you all are doing to make this event safe and bring it back. I was just at an event this weekend and they did a great job many of the things that you're doing much smaller but um it felt very comfortable and very safe so really appreciate all the work that you all have put into that um i want to shift a little bit to um just some kind of the some of the gear and tips and insider things and i think probably i'll let uh christy and kim talk a little bit about some of their stuff but um or some of their insights because I know Christy always has great advice and Kim obviously is passionate about helping other women. I just met her today, but um, she has great advice too. And then if you all have specific questions, why don't you go ahead and start putting those in chat and we'll answer those. So they could be about the course, about what's happening. Don't bother Treva. She'll answer your questions tomorrow if you have to change your dates. Um, but uh, yeah, or as gear and tips or things come up, if you didn't know that there's like, you know, limestone and you're afraid you're gonna flat or whatever it is. So you can go ahead and start asking those questions and I'll turn it over to you ladies, Christy. And I've lost Christy, is she still on? I'm here. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I guess I would start with some of like the things that I think are think are the, the must haves. Um, and the, the biggest one is making sure that you're your tire selection is appropriate and, and that you're tubeless if you can be tubeless. Um, using in a product, uh, you know, we obviously work with Orange Seal as a sponsor of the event and we work with them for a very good reason. Um, and it's because their product really, really works. Um, and that really will save you time um, with like any micro flat or micro cuts that you may get because um, that Orange Seal will act to fill, to fill that hole. Um, so I think that's, that's probably one of my, um, must haves for the day. Um, and the other things to me that, that really impacted when I did my race, when I, when I completed the event in 2018, that were things that were important to me and, and the success I had there was, um, I did a lot of recovery on the bike, like really trying not to just continually be moving forward. If you follow Jay Peterberry, he always says, you know, ride forward and just keep, keep moving forward. Um, so recovery on the bike. And then at the same time, kind of understanding, um, that every second counts, you want to be using your time wisely. I mean, we do have cutoff times for the, for the 200 and the 100 milers. And if you miss those checkpoint cutoffs time times, your day is over and that kind of sucks. So you wanna be very aware of, of where you're at on the course and, and how much further you have to go to get to a checkpoint so that you're not ending your race prematurely. Um, and I, I guess finally, you know, it's like really practice what you're eating and drinking um, before you come to the event. Don't try something new the day of, just, just don't do it. Um, but I, you know, my setup included a Camelback. Um, I actually used I actually had two camelbacks um, so that my support crew could reload the camelback that I dropped at the checkpoint town and, and be able to take off with the next, you know, get, get, get on my way and, and just swap camelbacks versus having to take the time to completely refill them. Oddly enough, it worked out great because I had a second 
setup of tools um, that was in one of my camelbacks. And in the very first 50, the very first section of the year I did it, my saddlebag bounced off into the middle of the Flint Hill somewhere and I never found it. Um, so being out there with no tools, no tubes, nothing was not very, um, <laughs> wasn't very reassuring, but I did have another set of that to, to pick up at the checkpoint. So it worked out for that reason, but um, I'm better at just kind of asking, you know, answering questions that you guys have about, about the event and, and what, what you're worried about, what experiences you may be wondering, you know, what it's like for this or that. And, um, you know, obviously Kim's going to have some tips too. So. so we've got, got a couple coming in. Um, so first, just on one thing that you said, Christy is what do you mean by recovery on the bike? Um, try to eat on the bike. Um, you know, don't, I didn't spend a ton of time in checkpoints. I tried to make sure that, um, you know, I would get my food out and handy so that I could like eat, eat half a sandwich while I'm rolling, um, taking advantage of the downhills occasionally and, and just recovering a little bit and, you know, making sure that I had enough energy to keep going. So using that time, like those, those natural downtimes that come on a bike to, to just kind of recover and regroup. Awesome. And then Kim, did you use a camelback? Somebody, Allie was asking if camelback, yes or no. Yeah. So I use, I actually brought mine. I took mine out. USWE is the one I use. I, I don't, I'm a huge hydration vest fan because bottle dropping is my go-to. I just drop bottles on gravel all the time. It's like, you know, um, so I personally like hydration vest. Whether you do the bottles, because it sounds like, you know, Leland said that there's going to be plenty of opportunities for water checkpoints. You decide, hey, no, I just want four bottle cages. Just take bottles and not do the hydration vest. Whatever you decide to do, don't decide to do it on race day. You know, to Christy's point, get, I'll give you an example. So one of the girls I, I was friends with that also did the race, she had a special kind of bib that had a clip in the back, you know, and so she got the hydration vest, she rode once with it and it, that she couldn't wear the bib with that hydration pack, just for example. So whatever you're gonna do, work through your products, work through your gear and practice, like go out, wear the bib that you're gonna wear, make sure you like the chamois, tie that to the hydration, you know, you wanna do all that on distance too. Don't just put it on and go, oh, I'm gonna go ride 20 miles and it's good to go because 20 miles and 100 miles, very different. So yeah, I'm a big hydration vest fan, but it's, it's very personal. So I just have no, I'm a bottle dropper. <laughs> I will I say I saw so many bottles dropped at this event this past weekend. Yes. Yeah. And I had forgotten because I hadn't ridden in an event in so long, how dusty it gets. Mm -hmm. um, so then you're like just drinking grit. So it's nice to have it. it yeah. I can stay more hydrated. When I, I bring bottles too. I put my electrolytes in my bottles. Yeah. And I put okay. water in my hydration pack. Right. Um, okay. We're getting, uh, if we go back a few questions about checkpoints, like checkpoint times, if what's, what are the rules going to be for the crews at checkpoints? Leela, maybe this is one to bounce to you. Um, the rules for support crew. That is a great question. Um, they're, they're fairly simple. I will say this. So our checkpoint towns occur outside of Lyon County and those counties are much more rural than even we are. So um, they tend to take even a little bit more relaxed stance on things. But um, for again, the event's going to go above and beyond. So first and foremost, I know it's a reunion, but just try to limit your interactions with uh, people that didn't come in your travel group. So that may mean hanging out in your car. If you do decide to get out of your vehicle, either because A, you need to go to the bathroom, B, you want to get something to eat or drink, or C, you're servicing your rider, then put your mask on and, and just keep that social distance whenever possible. Um, and that's really it. Um, as, as long as you're staying in or near your vehicle and reducing the your exposure and, and the proximity to other people that you didn't travel with, using your mask when you can't observe that social distance, you should be in pretty good shape. Um, so that's from a COVID perspective. And then just in a general sense, um, your support crew can help you with just about everything except giving you a new bike. You have to finish on the same bike that you started on. You can change your tire, you can change your wheel, you can change your seat, 
you can change certain things out, but it has to be the same bike frame that you started on. Otherwise, your support crew person can rub your feet. They can fill your bottles. They can stuff food in your mouth. Um, they can't get on the bike and finish for you, though. Can't get on the bike. <laughs> like sandy butter, if that's the relationship you have, I don't know. <laughs> but they can do just about anything for you other than finish it for you or give you a new bike. Um, they're, that your support crew is your lifeline. And I strongly suggest having great communication with that person, setting up your expectations in advance about what you want to see when you arrive at that checkpoint goes a long, long way. If they're an inexperienced person, especially if they're a good experienced pit crew, they probably know what they're doing and what you need from them. But if, if you're both new to it, then um, definitely doing some research and learning what you want. And that's where I think Christy said it or someone said it earlier, practice in advance. Don't show up and have this be the first time you are figuring out what you want at that checkpoint. Try to schedule a long training ride and have your person meet you halfway. Um, simulate as much as you can uh, beforehand. Okay, we're getting a lot of uh, questions and Kim's answering a lot of them on tires, but maybe just a quick overview because this is this is the eternal gravel question, right? Yeah. Tire, tire pressure. Yeah, tires and tire pressure. Um, I I run the Maxis Ramblers. Um, again, you know, and the people that we have as sponsors, they're there for a reason. Um, and there are other great products. Believe me, it is the tire tire manufacturing, especially for gravel, has come a long way um, since we started this event in twenty in two thousand six. So um, that's what I run. Um, the Shimano has a great guide we actually should put that up somewhere um a great guide to tire pressure that really actually helped me i actually lowered my tire pressure a little bit after reading it and i tend to run probably around 30 to 32 um, for my tire pressure um, it's made the bike ride a little bit more comfortable um, and i don't feel like i've really lost any speed that's just because i've become a little bit lazier than anything. but um uh the I'm sure Shimano's got that on their website somewhere, but they've done some great work with that. Um, if anything, um, I could I could surely get it if you guys want to send me an email or something and I can get it over to you so that you can look at it. Um, Claire posted it in the gravel group not long ago. Okay. Um, it's super that. helpful, okay. honestly. Um, so tire, tire pressure and that and and being tubeless. And uh, know how to boot. I want to add a quick little note about this subject of flats, if I may. Um, the number one type of flat tire that you'll get, I know we talk a lot about the cuts and that's common, but to Christy's point, if you've got orange seal in there, you're going to seal a good yes, majority of them unless you really just cut it. So the actual real trouble is if you're running tubes, you're going to get a pinch flat. Mm -hmm. almost guaranteed you'll pinch a tube. And that's why we highly recommend you um, putting in the sealant. Now you're saying, okay, Leland, great. If I start out with that, but let's say I do get a cut that I have to boot and now I've got to put a tube in, make absolute sure you pump that tube up with some good pressure. If the pressure's too low, you're going to compress that tire and pinch it against the rim. And that's that snake bite pinch flat. That's what that, that's what happens. What happens is you're tired. You got a hand pump if you don't have CO2 and you just don't get enough air in that thing. That's really important. There is another thing you can do though. Watch it. And it has a lot to do with how you handle the bike as a rider. Pay attention to cattle guards that are coming up. They usually have about an inch or two lip on them. And you got to pull that front wheel up and kind of pop your back tire up. That's a skill you should practice coming into it. Um, I'm not saying a full on bunny hop, but just one at a time, jumping up your front wheel and then pulling up your back. That'll save you for 99.9% .9 of the pinch flats that could occur out there. Pump up proper pressure and not smashing into big rocks or cattle guards or lips. So just keep your eyes forward and watch your line and know what's coming at you. Being aware, you will avoid a lot of them. Not everything, because sometimes an inadvertent rock can get you in a way you just didn't expect. But you can really avoid a lot of the tire trouble that people run into. And a lot of that just happens later in the day when you get tired. And I know it's tough, but that's part of the mental game is keeping aware and, and keeping focused. Leland has another meeting to get to. <laughs> I heard your thing. Um, okay, I, I think like this might be a good one. Uh, nobody has asked it yet, but 
and I have not done this event, I will say, but I have a good friend that did it. And then I saw her at the, her next event. I, I was her support crew and she had, she was very prepared for that event because she learned something uh, unbound. So uh, Christy and Ken, maybe you could talk about like what things, what are the things that maybe people don't think about that they should have with them and have then also at their bag drops. So Christy, you mentioned like you had an extra set of tools, like, you know, Lauren was like, I took a derailleur hanger and it saved me. <laughs> um, so kind of those things. Leland, um, and Treba jump into as well. Yeah, I, I guess I would say I had, I had things to fit. So first of all, I, I can't imagine racing gravel and not having tubeless tires. I'll just say it. Um, and I don't have a sponsor or anything, <laughs> you know, someone to promote. Um, you just got to go tubeless. It, it, it lets you bring your tire pressure a lot lower. So for those longer distances, it's just going to be more comfortable. It's less heartache. I'm a big fan of controlling the controllables. Obviously that's a big part of my professional life, but I do it in cycling and racing and it's control the controllables, right? So mitigate the things that are just going to wreck your day. And, you know, Kansas gravel, most gravel, most good gravel that you want to race or ride on. Uh, regardless of what you're there to do, you're going to need tubeless tires. Um, and then the pressure, which Christy talked on, is everything. It's going to help your ride. It's going to make it easier. It's going to make it easier to find your lines in deep gravel, um, which some people call like kitty gravel. It looks like kitty litter. You know, the deeper it gets, it's, it's nice to have that pressure, to the lower pressure and run the lower pressure. Um, I would say there's bacon strips. There's some stuff. I forgot the name of it, but it's like a foam sealant. Uh, I carried that. I did carry a derailleur hanger. I did not carry a full derailleur. All these things are great, but I, you know, I always say control the controllables, practice the plan, but then practice the non-plan, right? Practice the things you can't control. I went to my bike shop, you know, and volunteered there for a couple hours. So they would teach me how to like make a tubeless tire with a tube, um, you know, cause that's messy. So, you know, what did I learn? I need to bring rubber gloves. And so I had, you know, I practiced, you know, taking, breaking the sealant off the rim, right? And putting it in a tube. That's your worst case scenario in a tubeless tire fail. Um, but you've got, again, to Leland's point and Christy's point, you've got really good sealant. That's gonna seal a lot of your, you know, holes that you might get, the little pinches here and there. And then you've got, I'd say the next level is like bacon strips or foam sealant. And then your worst day, in my opinion, is you got a tube of tire. Um, and that'll get you, you know, through the day, that and CO2. Um, and all those things are great, if you, but if you don't know how to do it, you don't know how to change a derailleur hanger, or you don't know how to put a tube in a tire, then there's no point in carrying it. Um, so practice, again, the, the things that you can do to mitigate or when you come up with those mechanicals, because again, Christy's point earlier, right? Tick tock, the clock's going and every minute counts. So if the first time you're putting a tube in a tire is race day and you're just like, Wah, you know, and then you can't finish because you just can't figure it out. So that would be my two cents there on the mechanical and, side. <laughs> I think I, I would say, I mean, some of those things, even if you don't know how to use them, um, there is a bit of an argument for going ahead and carrying them because um, somebody may very well be willing to help you um, and they may know how to use them. And that definitely happens. You can help, you can accept help from other riders on the course. Um, and honestly, one of the things that, that I know, and I'm, I am, over the moon that there are so many of you that are the first timers that are coming to do this event. It, it just makes, it just makes my heart so happy. I also know that when you start hearing this stuff, that's when you start freaking out. Like, I don't know how to do that. This gets so overwhelming. I'm never going to be able to learn that, 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 you know, and you just start going down that rabbit hole. The very first year I did it, my husband was loading my support kit, my kit, like my support crew kit up with like all of this stuff. And I looked at him and I said, and I, you know, I share this story because I think it's important to hear this as well. If I'm having that kind of day, I'm going to get picked up. Like I'm not going out there to just change flat after flat, after flat, after flat. If that's the kind of day that I end up having, I'm okay with saying it's not my day and calling to get help. So yes, I mean, I'm not telling you not to be prepared, definitely be prepared. But when you're listening to this, Take all of it with a little bit of a grain of salt and realize there's there's are, are other people out there that will help you, um, you know, for sure know how to change a flat for sure. Um, but then don't don't let all of this knowledge start making it so that you feel like you can't do one of these events because that's just not true. 
you should definitely try it and then and and learn and learn as you go if you have to so that's you know i always i always think about that because i i just looked at my husband going i i don't know how to do that and i'm not i'm not going to do it so if that's the kind of day i end up having i'm out and yeah, i've learned a lot I wasn't trying to scare people off. No, I know. I know. Yeah. I'm sure. Information is not like, I just feel like for me, I just wanted to know yep. all the information, right? And then yep. do with it what you may uh, and filter what you may. But yeah. Yep, for 